Well, the name of my presentation is pretty much the name of the conference. And as I was writing this up, I was thinking, you know what, in one way or another, the name of almost every one of our conferences is sort of similar to this because we've all been fighting to preserve our breeds and to preserve our ability to keep our animals for the 31 years or 32 years, I guess, that NAIA has been here. Um, this, the subtitle of this was a little jarring for some. It says, and preparing for the looming dog shortage. And maybe that subtitle is a little bit misleading, but not because the issue is not real and not because um, it doesn't express a, a part of reality. I guess if I had had a little more time and thought about it, I might have called that, I might have put a subheading in as positioning ourselves to reverse the trend that threatens the preservation of purebred dogs and widespread dog ownership. And I add widespread dog ownership because in the countries in Europe where purebred dogs have diminished greatly, dog ownership eventually diminishes as well. You can look at the trend lines and see that there's real big connection between people valuing purpose-bred dogs and wanting to keep dogs as pets, right? So um, I think that before I kind of, uh, talk about the way forward or what I'm hoping for and so on, I will I try to get you oriented to where we are, right? We're all at different stages of understanding what's going on. And so I used Yogi here and he says, if you don't know where you're going, you might wind up someplace else. So with that, with that in mind, I'm going to try to tell you where we are. Okay. And uh, this is a graph. Uh, we have a program called the NAIA Shelter Project and we graph data from shelters, 3,500 shelters in all. There's about 5,000 shelters in the country. So we have the biggest database of shelter data of any organization in the country. And this particular graph is for the state of Colorado. And we pick Colorado because they have the best data, the most robust data and the most detailed data that you can get. They not only can tell you how many dogs are coming into shelters every year, but what the disposition of those dogs is, what the ultimate outcome is. Are they euthanized? Are they returned to owner? Are they um, placed with the public? Are they adopted out? And they can also tell you whether where the dogs came from. They have, um, they require every single animal industry and they include rescues and shelters. So it's not just licensed breeders of a certain size and pet stores, but also they require the um, shelter, little shelters and rescues to become licensed with the state. And then they ask them to fill out a form every year in order to keep their license to tell everybody where they got their, where they got their dogs. And so uh, this particular graph shows that they started graphing or they started keeping this data on the number of dogs coming into the state to shelters in 2007. And you can see that from 2007 until 2019, this is before COVID, they had risen to 36,985 dogs being imported into the state of Colorado into rescues and shelters. And that's because there's no, no, no longer enough locally bred dogs or produced dogs to meet the demand. So that's why this graph is very important, why it's very telling about what's going on sort of be below the surface. And then for my own city here, we have Oregon Humane Society. And up until COVID, they were importing 66% of all of their dogs. Uh, again, shows you a local shortage of dogs. Not, dogs are not being produced by breeders. Uh, you know, we got rid of the casual breeders. We told everybody to spay and neuter their dogs. And, uh, and they did dutifully. And by the way, it wasn't just the so-called humane groups, but also our kennel clubs, our parent clubs. We all wanted everybody to neuter their dogs so that we could reduce dog overpopulation. And by golly, we did. Almost nobody is breeding dogs anymore. Uh, the people in this room are, are in a minority, that's for sure. So 66% of the dogs that uh, Oregon Humane Society brought in right up until COVID um, were dogs that were brought in from outside the area. 
Um, the dogs are shuffled around from shelter to shelter too. So there's a lot of stuff happening below the surface that, that um, this particular graph doesn't really show you. But this downturn, you might just say, well, it is all COVID, but maybe it's hiding something else that is going on in a little greater numbers that might be accelerating a little bit than before. Um, those Tualatin Kennel Club is here, right? Here's a little rescue um, that is located in Tualatin. Oregon Dog Rescue works with kill shelters, primarily in Mexico, Texas, and California, but also Hawaii, blah, blah, blah. So they're not just taking dogs from outside the city of Portland. Um, we are bringing dogs in in pretty massive numbers from um, outside of not only our state, but coming in from Mexico. And one of the reasons Mexico has become so popular lately is because the CDC uh, banned the import of dogs from over 100 countries where the incidence of rabies was very high. Well, Mexico isn't one of those countries. And so it's really become a hot source for dogs in the United States. And uh, they come up from, from California, uh, primarily this particular one. The next one, uh, this one is bragging that they've already brought in 20,000 dogs, and they also come in from Mexico. 20,000 dogs, and I looked, uh, they were founded in 2015. So it's not 20,000 in one year, but it's a pretty good number. And I left it over on my table there somewhere, but I have a sheet that shows you another 20 groups that are importing dogs just into this area. And I'll share that with anybody. I'll either share it with you later, I'll send you a link. But the thing you need to know is that I could produce a chart like that for practically every Northern state in the United States. Oregon is not unique. Um, Oregon is uh, very, very typical in terms of the number of dogs that are available, or I should say the number of dogs that aren't available and that create this opening then for all of the importation that's going on. So um, in Mexico, the shelters and rescues are very aware of this and they advertise constantly. There's rescue tourism is huge. If you go to Mexico, they try to get you to bring a dog back either for yourself or, or to put into um, a rescue. And then a lot of the shelters down there are advertising to the United States, like they're a store. If you look, this is the front page of a rescue called Bon Voyage. And if you see this little area that I've circled here, it's a button on their website that says, uh, at the top, it says, love dogs, come to the, you've come to the right place. And then it tells you all the different things that you can get there. And one is, our rescue shelter needs more dogs. You can press that button and just make an order and they'll ship to any place in the country. So when I see that downturn, and I think, you know, 2019 was the high year, and then we go down when COVID hits, you might just assume that's all that's happening, but it's not. Um, they have uh, accelerated the importation of dogs, especially from Mexico. And they're bringing them in by truck, and they're also bringing them in by plane. This is a, a plane that arrived for Oregon Humane Society. Now, what typically happens, though, is they don't bring them directly to the shelters that have high profiles and good media departments. They bring them to other shelters, and then those shelters sort of launder the dogs into, into the other shelters. So very, for instance, in Oregon, Southern Oregon Humane Society is a, a big drop-off point for a lot of the dogs that come up from Mexico. But there are other shelters along the way that do that, too. Okay, so... Um, this is Cassandra. I don't know if you remember your Greek mythology, but, but uh, when I was on the AKC board, I was sort of dubbed that at a certain point in time, because I was always very worried about the future supply of dogs, where we were going at, you know, at a certain point in time. I got there in 1995. Mark mentioned to you yesterday that we peaked in 1993. By the way, that is exactly why I decided to become a delegate because we had been watching the media surrounding dog legislation. A lot of times when you look at legislation, you kind of take it at face value, it's just legislation. But when the animal rights community brings legislation forward, they always have a huge media campaign with it too. And the media campaign is always very negative about breeders. And so I was working with a friend, started working on legislation in 1988, kind of accidentally. It wasn't my passion. It wasn't something I really planned to do at all. It just got kind of dragged into it. Um, but we began to watch these media campaigns and we would say to each other every year, 
one of these days, the number of purebred dogs is going to start diving. And I literally became a delegate the year after that statistic appeared because you knew it was inevitable base. I, I agree with what Mark said during his presentation that a big part of the downturn was because of the really lousy old fashioned customer service at AKC, which he had, which they have greatly improved now. But another huge factor was just the continuous alignment of breeders, anything to do with people actually producing dogs. So anyway, Cassandra here um, is famous because Apollo gave her the gift of foresight, but then when she didn't return his advances, he cursed her with the inability to get anybody to believe her. So I used, I used to sit there at the board and say, you know, we're really gonna have a problem because we're not gonna have, you know, we're going down the tubes here. And then somebody else would say, oh, Patty, there will always be dogs. Don't worry. People love dogs. And then I would say, but they don't have to be our dogs. And that's exactly what's happening now. So I'm going to take a little credit as Cassandra because the dogs that we're, we're now seeing in households um, are certainly, certainly there aren't as many of them that are ours as there used to be. And it's not a competitive thing. The issue is that so many of the dogs that are replacing the dogs that we used to breed have serious health problems, they have serious behavior problems. As a matter of fact, a great number of the rescue dogs are really sold by, um, because they're victims. They have you know, some kind of health problem that somebody has to adopt in order to take care of. That's very appealing to people. So in many cases, we see dogs being adopted and even marketed for their disabilities or whatever, that if we sold, we would be on the front page of, of the newspaper for you know, uh, some kind of consumer problem, right? So anyway, we're, we're in this situation. You have this snake here with he's eating his own tail. And that's sort of what's happened to the rescues and shelters. They have pushed regulations, what, for 30, 35 years now. And, and by the way, when I talk about shelters, I'm not talking about all shelters. There are a lot of wonderful shelters out there. I'm really talking about what I would call big humane. I used to call it animal rights, but the fact is the groups that we are up against or that are up against us are many, many, many of them are ideological and the ideology that they would tell you that they espouse as animal rights, a particular belief that people shouldn't use animals for any purpose, et cetera. But another part of it is just greed. It's just money. And so I've kind of put the to, you know, big humane is what I call it. I think everybody kind of gets that. It's not your local humane society that just wants you to be kind to animals. It's a different kind of thing. So overregulation, and most of the people in this group really don't have a problem with reasonable legislation. We all think that it's appropriate for people to keep their dogs in their yards. And, and we don't want, you know, people to be breeding their dogs willy nilly when they don't have good homes for them. We don't want to get back to like it was in 1960 or 1970 or even the early 90s. We all are very reasonable people here. But so much of the legislation that we see um, when we're dealing with uh, animal issues is brought by radical groups with very sophisticated marketing ability and it's misguided. So it always does way more than it claims, just like Cindy was talking about when she was talking about the biomedical research side of things earlier today. It's, it's not that there aren't some things that should be done. It's not that there aren't some things that we would champion. It's that they do way more than that. They do it deliberately. It is um, called conflict fundraising is what they do. It's, um, well, it's a form of cause marketing, but it's specifically called conflict fundraising because in order for them to be good, somebody else has to be bad because when you really think about it, they don't bring anything to the equation. It's not like when HSUS or PETA comes to town and makes a claim about something that somebody's doing wrong. It isn't like they step in and say, let me help. You know, what they did during Katrina is they provided t-shirts to the people that were working down in Katrina so they could take pictures of them, had their logo on the front of it. Not, not a lot of help. So that's, that's kind of uh, what we're used to seeing. Okay, so what's the scope of this? Um, over a we, we're working on a bill called the Healthy Dog Importation Act. One of the things that we had to do in order to get 
the lawmakers to believe that there was a real problem was we had to demonstrate that there was a big number of dogs coming in. And so when the 2018 farm bill came around, we got some language, some report language put into it that required the government to do a study that would tell us how many dogs were coming in. And it came in at 1.06 million to 1.2 million. And from Mark's presentation earlier, you'll remember that it takes about 8 million dogs to replace the dogs that die every year, not to expand the marketplace, just to replace the ones that die every year. And uh, so that's an eighth of the dog marketplace. That's a significant number of dogs that are coming in. And if I showed you a graph of the whole country rather than just the ones I've showed you for the individuals for Colorado and then for our Humane Society, you would see that this is just steadily going up. There's been no break in it. The importation of dogs for domestic um, ownership here has done nothing but increase. In 2007, when they did a little bit of study on their own at CDC, they estimated it to be 287,000. So in the next 14 years or whatever, whatever it was, 2007 to 2018, actually, the next 11 years, we um, went up to a million point two. And there's no doubt in my mind that without watching this, it's going to be steadily increasing. And we know that um, one of the things that has happened um, in the last probably two or three years, maybe since COVID, maybe a little bit before, before that, the shelters are businesses, right? They're nonprofits, but they're businesses. They have staffs to take care of. They have facilities to take care of. And they're looking at all this and they're figuring out how to stay in business. And so there is not going to be an end in sight of this massive importation on its own. This is something we're going to have to deal with or the dogs that are produced, the few dogs that are still produced here in the United States deliberately um, are going to be displaced. That's what's happening now. So uh, this is a, bill, a billboard that Oregon Humane put up in Portland. It kind of tells you that they have a new direction. This is a new mission. You know, it used to be be kind to animals or, you know, we're, we're going to take care of, of your dogs if they're in trouble and so on. But now it is, we're going to end petlessness. So this is sort of a, a pet store kind of orientation, I think we can all see. Okay, so what do we have? Groups working under the banner of, again, what I call Big Humane, are working to eliminate what they see as their marketplace rivals. There's no question about that. We, we see that. And there's even a group that was formed recently by ex-Humane Society and Animal Control Directors. I just saw it online right before I came. I believe it has the initials H-A-S-S. -A -S. I didn't have time to grab it and put it in here. But they're very worried about what they see because they're hearing shelter personnel in different places that they've worked and that they still have contact with talking about breeding dogs to make, I mean, the orientation is different. They're going to make sure that there are dogs and they're going to be bred the way they think they should be, which is by them. So, okay, so there's legislation to ban hobby breeders instituted in multiple states this year. Um, one of the reasons why it's really important to understand what's happening in the commercial dog breeding world is that many of the um, bills that are targeting commercial dog breeders and pet stores are also targeting hobby breeders. You need to understand that. And so you need to understand what part of the rhetoric is true, right? And I think the presentation that we had just a bit ago is really fabulous because the picture that most people carry around in their head of what a commercial kennel looks like is one that they got 20, 30 years ago. It's not in, it's not in sync with what's actually happening. And uh, that doesn't mean that hobby breeders uh, need to be thinking about selling dogs to pet stores or anything like that. We're, nobody's advocating that. We're just saying, you know, when you're in an argument with somebody, you should know what the facts are. You shouldn't be deluded by what the activists who are making money by their conflict fundraising tell you. So um, I think it was, maybe it was Bree that talked about the legislation that we had in Lafayette. That legislation um, included banning pet stores and all breeders. We had something kind of similar in Florida earlier earlier this year, right, Judy? 
you had you had something down there that was very very similar and so we're seeing these trickle out and again as somebody who's worked in this now for 32 years um you you get little outcroppings of what's coming next uh just like this in other words there's a discussion that's happening at the highest levels and they're beginning to trickle it out in different places but i've now seen about seven of these where hobby breeders are included in the bands um, and then I mentioned here that a small number of, of kennels, or excuse me, shelters are starting to breed dogs. What we see more often are programs that enable shelters to get puppies through other means. They will uh, introduce a program called um, last, last Litter. And so if you accidentally let your dam get pregnant, you can bring her to them. They will whelp her, they will keep the puppies, and then they will spay her for free. And we're, we're seeing a lot of those around the country. So purebred dogs are pretty important. A lot of times when people think about them or talk about them, they're uh, you know, thinking about some kind of elitist thing, you know, a, a blue blood trend on something only for the rich. I mean, that's still in somebody's, in a lot of people's heads. But when I think of purebred dogs, I just think about this incredible tradition we have. Now this is statuary from it says 6,000 to 35 BC. Um, and I can't help but notice that modern, Sight hounds, uh, clearly, you know, this is a, um, they're not exactly the same genes. I'm sure if you looked at the genome, they're not, they're not the same. But these dogs, these purpose-bred dogs have been around forever. The greyhound is mentioned specifically in the Bible. If you look at some of Homer's writing, you know, I think um, when, when, Odys I never say his name right, Odysseus, whatever, when he, when he gets back, None of his relatives recognize him anymore because he's old, he's been away at the war, but his dog Argus does. So dogs are just, they're part of our lives, they're part of our social history. And purebred dogs are very, very important. Again, you know, um, some of the folks that are in the pet industry, they can probably make a bag of dog food for any dog. So there isn't anything special about us if your entire bottom, if your entire thinking about this issue is bottom line, as long as somebody will eat your dog food, it, it's okay. But long term, this is going to have a huge effect if we don't get it under control on the entire dog marketplace, not just purebreds, because purebreds are just, just that. They were purpose bred. They are what people want. This is what they brought into their homes and domesticated rather than the street dogs that we're now getting from Egypt and from South Asia and all the different places. So um, we have to really uh, think carefully about what we need to do to make sure that we can turn this around. Um, we did a study, uh, it's been about three years ago now, and um, it was called How Outdated Perceptions Are Reshaping the Dog Marketplace. I can send you a copy if you like, but what is, you know, what the study points out is that although household dog ownership is higher than it's ever been before, it is accompanied by parallel decreases in the number of dogs being produced from the longstanding traditional sources like us. <laughs> so it's, um, you know, it is eye opening. I would recommend that you read it. So uh, NAI does do studies that uh, really look at data. One of the things that we found in this study, it had a, it was a thousand and it, it was pretty well done in terms of um, the demographics, making sure that it was balanced and everything. But one of the questions that we asked that we got a surprising answer to, I mean, it even surprised us after all these years of working in it. We asked um, among 60 other questions, if, um, we ask respondents if they agreed with the statement, it is okay to purchase dogs instead of adopting them from a rescue or shelter. And this stunned us. It was 34.4 agreed it was okay to 34.6 that disagreed. I mean, that is that tells you where public opinion is, public perception is right now. And um, so we're gonna have to do better. <laughs> Interestingly, in that same study, only 9% of the people thought that it was appropriate to bring dogs into the country for, for sale, basically, the humane relocation internationally. So that is probably why, when I showed you that downward curve since COVID, um, a lot of things have changed with the shelters. We used to be able to get really good data, for instance, from Oregon Humane Society. 
but they've quit publishing their data. Many of the shelters that are engaged in um, a lot of importation are now using a, a new platform that they've set up called Shelter Count. And it's really, really good if you're a shelter, but if you're a, a research scientist, somebody really trying to find out what's going on, they mix dogs and cats together. And, and unless you pay money, you can't really pull the data out of it like you can our public database. So we're not seeing new data from there at all. And I think that's another indication of, of where they're going with their business plan. Okay, we, we did another study a while ago. One of the issues when, when dog overpopulation was driving a lot of the legislation that we saw, um, we thought, well, let's take a look and find out how many purebreds are really in shelters. And the website of the Humane Society of the United States had said 25% of shelter dogs were purebred forever. And that of course helped drive the negative legislation but we did, I believe, the most comprehensive study that's been done on it. We hired a college student as an intern, and we literally looked at two shelters in each of the nine census divisions every single Monday morning for 52 weeks. And we came up with this number by uh, assessing what they actually had on hand. And if you removed the breeds that were identified as AMSTAFs, or pit bulls, but purebred rather than just all the other ones that look like them because they have short fat muzzles and so on. And you remove the chihuahuas, you actually got down to 3%. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it was, there was a lot of articles around about how this couldn't be right. But thankfully, Mars did a study maybe a year and a half later using DNA, and they came up with 5% five, with 5 exactly. Ours was 5.02%. So we feel pretty confident that that's really what's happening in, in the shelter world. And that certainly helps us when overpopulation is used um, as a reason to ban or to further regulate the breeding of purebred dogs. Um, our shelter project, we have a, a board member that isn't here this weekend, who's utterly fabulous, couldn't live without her, Barb Reichman, many of you have maybe met her. But she maintains the shelter project. So the graphs that you saw earlier, I mentioned we have about 3,500 shelters that are in this database and she manages it. She does all this as a volunteer. And, and so we're able to uh, accumulate real information to tell the world what the real trends are. Because if you just read the paper or you read uh, the press releases that are put out by the fundraising groups, you would not, you'd never conclude this, what we're seeing. Um, we are very involved in legislation all the time. I resent doing legislation, actually. I mean, it's always reactive, right? The bad guys have always come in with a bill and we have to go fight it. And it, it really gets frustrating. Um, we have introduced a, a federal bill that we think is extremely important. Um, it's called the Healthy Dog Importation Act. It does not seek to prevent dogs from coming into the United States. It requires that they're healthy. It requires that they have basically the kind of things that we require. You know, if you get on a plane and you fly across the country, you have to get a health certificate. Believe it or not, in the United States, you don't have to do that if you're coming in from a lot of countries around the world. We have probably the weakest import requirements of any of the developed countries. There are countries in Africa that have better better import requirements than we do. So we've been working on this. It seems like forever. We uh, started uh, working in Washington, DC in 2016. And uh, I mentioned to you that we were able to get the report in the last farm bill in 2018 requiring that somebody do a study to tell the world how many dogs were coming in. <clears throat> it was shocking to us. We had already been on PBS, National Public Radio, a number of the major news stations, and I'd personally done 18 articles on it with all kinds of good documentation, and uh, nobody in Congress had ever heard of this issue. So it just shows you um, the work that we need to do to just get the message out about what's real, because it definitely serves our adversaries' um, purposes to misrepresent things so that they can accomplish the goals that they have. I have another picture for you here, and if you look real close, it's uh, the one over on the your right side, you'll see that 
gal sitting right here in front of me is in that picture. We were we worked together to defeat a pet store bill back in 2019, and she did a marvelous job testifying. And her, her, the veterinarian that she worked with also did a great job, and we had a good day. Unfortunately, as Bob mentioned earlier, uh, we have that bill back again this year. And uh, as he also alluded to, unless something, you know, helps us politically, we're probably dead in the water. And the thing he's talking about that might help is that um, this year in our legislature, we have a super majority of, of Democrats, not saying that's good or bad. I, I think anytime the Republicans and Democrats are too far out of whack with each other, so that they can't have real conversations. You know, it's like Florida has typically been kind of good because it's usually 45, 55, although I know they have a majority of uh, Republicans. They have a super majority of Republicans now, I think. But when when one side so greatly outweighs it the other that they don't even have to get one vote from the other side is not good. Anyway, here in Oregon, the Republicans have walked out. And so they're not able to get a quorum to vote on some of these things. So we may be saved by the bell simply because the Republicans are, are out. And they didn't go out because of this bill. They went out because of a couple of other bills that we have regarding um, gender and whether or not uh, parents have to be notified and so on. So um, the way I see it is we are winning lots and lots of battles, but we are losing the war overall. We see this whole fight as a public relations war, and we think that we are losing right now. We can't win legislatively if the public agrees with our adversaries. And as that one graph I showed you, the 3434 shows you, they often do. That's their messages are out there. Their messages are percolating a lot better than ours. Um, and advocacy, I think for us, the direction that we're wanting to go We've always had a lot of programs in addition to working on legislation, but I will tell you that for my part, I would like to almost do nothing but programs and PR and communication because you, like I said, you, you cannot uh, beat these guys if, if the lawmakers believe every, every word that the bad guys have to say. And, and certainly there's politics in all of that too. But I also meet lawmakers, and I'm sure you do too, Bob, um, talking to Pet Advocacy Network back there, Bob Likens. Um, that, that there are people who actually believe these stories. They have a, they truly believe that what the activists tell them is true. So we've got a lot of work. They also, they also worry that the public believes the activists and therefore that they won't get reelected if they don't go along with them, right? So we think we must go on the offense with a unified sort of strategic campaign. And that's sort of why we created NAI in the first place is we realized that People, every one of these little groups, like Cindy's presentation this morning showed you the horse carriage folks. And probably at th that was 2015. You could probably add five or six other groups that have, have now been greatly, you know, either eliminated or greatly changed as a result of this. Um, our challenge is too big and too complex for most communications firms to handle. Um, in years past, I've had, <clears throat> we had some of the top PR firms in the country come in and they give you a tactic. They don't give you a plan, you know? They have a tactic for um, oh, op-ed pieces or a tactic for how to get you to be trained so you can do an interview on the radio or, you know, pieces. And the problem is, um, if we're not all on the same page on this, they just pick us off one by one. But the reason they give us tactics rather than a plan is they start looking at what we're up against and they, it blows their mind. I mean, you have groups of people, again, to Cindy Buckmaster's presentation this morning, she mentioned the Animal Liberation Front or showed them burning down a building in uh, one of her slides. That is a wing of the animal rights movement, right? They're there. And I don't see that they've really burned any kennels down. I do know of a, a big um, chicken farm uh, in Oregon that was burned down a few years ago and a mink facility that was burned down. But you have that kind of zealotry. You have a kind of uh, anybody that's worked in the legislature where it's a big issue for them. You'll see this. You'll see a kind of zealotry that you don't see among most people you'll meet, right? So uh, they see that. And then they recognize too that, for instance, HSUS and ASPCA together had to pay the biggest RICO settlement in history. 
$23 million, I think in total, RICO's racketeering influenced corrupt organizations. That's again, that's who we're, that's who we're dealing with here. Um, they also have hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars because the public is confused. Humane Society of the United States, after all, has humane in its title. So the public is confused, lawmakers are confused anyway. So they are able to continue. Um, they fund their drive for money and power basically by defaming people and industries. That's really, you know, in a nutshell, that's what you're up against. I used to, I used to use that as my definition. Animal rights is an ideologically based political militant movement that finances its drive for power and control by defaming people and industries. That's pretty, that's pretty much what it is. And um, again, conflict fundraising, they, um, there's a, a book written by some communications expert that I wrote, uh, read a long time ago. And he has the, th he talks about it as three V's, villain, victim, vindicator, uh, or you could do it in a different order. The victim is some animal that you have that you, they don't think you should have. Maybe you bred it. Maybe it's going to be subject to being euthanized because of overpopulation. So in some way, it's a victim. Um, you're a villain because you bred it. And they ride into town as the vindicators to save the day. And again, as I mentioned a little bit ago, it's not like they're putting money in to help. It's not like they're rolling up their sleeves. They're just talking bad about everybody else that's involved. Um, yeah, and... Um, Ideologically driven base, including ends justifies the means extremists. That's the burning down buildings or telling lies. Again, if you work in the legislative arena, you just sit there with your mouth open because they're willing to say whatever it takes. A lot of times it's not connected to any fact that anybody could point to. A lot of emotion. So, um, uh, and they come back year after year after year. They're relentless. Uh, one of the things that makes you tired on this score, like I said, we've fought this bill in Oregon and won twice before. They're back again this year. So you just, and they get a new legislature in there and they maybe have donated more PAC money. So, I mean, you're really, uh, it's, it's a real challenge. And there was one bill on the East Coast. It was a statewide bill. I believe it was in Maryland. I could be wrong. It's been about five, six years ago. And the chairman of the, I th believe it was the House Ag Committee, wouldn't let this bill out of committee. And so they, they, the folks that wanted this bill passed were wrangling every which way they could. They found out that the chairman of the committee, um, he was sharing this, that he was sick. He was um, in renal failure. And one of the activists who happened to be a niece volunteered her kidney. So and gave her, gave her kidney to him. So we don't have that happening on our side. We don't have people that are sitting on our side in the legislature going, well, just take my kidney, I wanna win. But anyway, that's, uh, that gives you, a, it gives you some idea of the zealotry and the relentlessness that we're up against. It's, it's uh, you have to experience it. How many of you have been in these arenas where you've seen this? Not you, Judy? I'm surprised your hand isn't up. Haven't you? Am I embarrassing you? I'm sorry if I am. Yeah, I'm thinking of your animal control meetings down in Florida. I'm thinking of some of the stuff that you've been through in the last few years there. So anyway, long story short, since I didn't get a rise out of you, Judy, <laughs> is uh, just uh, for us, we're really tired of being in a defensive posture. Uh, we're not really suited to go to war. I mean, we're not the real warrior type. So what we're really hoping for with NAIA and with all of you, all of us being together here, is that we're able to unify in a way that helps all of us and, um, and work together so we can get on the same page and, and be more effective as a group. So, and then that's how we'll feel. <laughs>